So when we take refuge, we're being very clear. And that clarity comes from hearing the Buddha's teachings and then thinking about them, applying logic and reasoning to them, trying them out ourselves, and then being convinced yeah, that they make sense and that uh, through our own experience we can see improvement in the state of our mind. Okay, That doesn't mean we're going to be uh, Buddha by next Tuesday. Yeah, oh yes, I see wonderful improvement. I came to BF on Sunday and by Tuesday I'm Buddha, yeah. No, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> okay, and why are we following this path? It's not because we want to be famous, uh, hear some teachings and then be the the tea shop guru. Okay, it's not because we want to do something mystical and magical and whoa, far out. Um, it's because we sincerely care for the welfare of all living beings, not just ourselves, and we sincerely want all living beings to attain full awakening and become Buddhas. Yeah. So that's a very lofty aspiration, but when we have that kind of mind, uh, then we're, over, we're able to overcome a lot of difficulties in our practice. Yeah. Because when we have the aspiration to work for the benefit of all beings and to develop our highest potential so we can do that, can you think of anything to criticize about that motivation? Yeah. If I said, you know, I, I'm practicing this path so I can be a teacher and have lots of followers all around me going like this, then you could complain about that motivation, couldn't you? But if my motivation is sincerely to be a benefit to all living beings, there's nothing to complain, there's nothing to criticize about that. Yeah, it may be difficult, to attain full Buddha, you know, full awakening. But difficulty doesn't matter. If we're doing something worthwhile and we know where we're going, then we just keep on that path and we go there. Yeah. We don't get, you know, waylaid, we don't get discouraged. You know, sometimes some discouragement may come. Yeah, but then we remember what we do, what we're doing and what our goal is. And then that, uh, you know, revitalizes our practice. Yeah. And, and also when we encounter obstacles in our life, you know, sometimes you get sick, sometimes you have financial problems, sometimes people don't like you and they talk behind your back. When you're aiming for full awakening, for the benefit of all beings, yeah, then are you going to let small things like that bum you out and make you depressed? Yeah, somebody else criticizes me, so what? Yeah, as ordinary beings, oh, somebody criticizes me, I'm devastated. <sighs> And they're talking behind my back and ruining my reputation and what's happening. Oh, I'm so unhappy. Right? Yeah? But if you're sincerely, your aim is to become a Buddha to benefit all beings. Okay, some people criticize you. It's a free world. They can have their own opinion. Yeah? Yeah. Do you give people permission to have their own opinion about you? Or do you say, no, nobody has 
permission to think anything they want about me. They must think I'm good. They must praise me. Yeah, is that going to work? That's not going to work. Okay. So this bodhicitta gives you incredible um, mental strength. Yeah. You're sick, you get sick, you're still aiming for full awakening. Yeah. You know that sickness is part of samsara. Okay. Oh, yeah. Of sickness, aging, um, I'm sorry, birth, aging, sickness, and death. Well, we've done the birth business. Yeah. So what happens after that? Sickness. Yeah, this is part of what samsara is about. Anybody here who's not been sick ever, ever, ever? No. Okay. It's part of our life. So you get sick. Why freak out? Yeah, you don't feel well for a few days. That's okay. You lie in bed, you take medicine, you rest. You get over it, you get well, life goes on. Yeah. It isn't like, oh, I got COVID. Ah, 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 I'm dying. Ah. You know, we don't have to react like that, you know. I got COVID in September. It was like a really bad cold. Yeah, lasted some time. I got well. Yeah, aging. Yeah, we know that's going to happen. Why, why let ourselves get bummed out about aging? Yeah, you grow fantastic, beautiful gray hair. Yeah, and your face is adorned with wrinkles that young people don't have. Those poor young people, they're deprived of wrinkles. Yeah, so they need to kind of have some life experience, then they'll get some wrinkles, but I have them and you don't. Yeah, and then you know, you can't walk as well. You have arthritis, yeah? Arthritis, oh, what a delightful thing. Now you don't have to pick up anything off the floor because everybody will do it for you. <laughs> because you can't bend down, yeah? And they don't complain, you know. When, when you're young, if you ask somebody to pick something up, it's like, well, maybe you do it yourself. But when you have arthritis, it's like, oh, they're very happy to pick it up for you. So you see, there's some advantages to, to aging. And once in a while, the young people actually figure out this is an astounding revelation to young people. They figure out that when you're old, you've actually learned something about life and that you have the ability to give some wise advice. Yeah. Old people recognize that about each other. Young people, you don't know how to you know, work your email. Well, anyway, nobody uses email. You don't know how to do a text message. Yeah. You don't know what a bot is. What's a bot? Yeah. And chat and GBT? <laughs> What's the GBT for? Can't you make it shorter? You know, it's like, you know, the older people are very practical. Yeah, don't add the GBT. It just takes too long to say it. Anyway, you can't remember it. <laughs> okay? So once in a while, young people figure out that older people know something. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I said, that's a big revelation. When I was 16, I thought I was almost omniscient. You know, I certainly knew much more than my parents. Yeah, my parents. Yeah, they don't know how to think correctly. They think that because I'm 16, I don't know how to take care of myself. I know how to take care of myself. Leave me alone, Mom and Dad. Yeah, give me the car keys, but don't tell me what time to be home. (laughs) Yeah, and if you want to see me, have the washing machine ready. Yeah, because I'm coming to see you and to do my laundry. Yeah, if you don't have a washing machine, why should I come and see you? So, you know... That's what you think when you're young. When you're older, it's like you want to go see somebody because you care about them. Yeah. And then, of course, death. Birth, sickness, aging, death. Yippee, death. Yeah. The thing that we are most terrified of, and when you're young, you think, Oh, it's not going to happen to me. It only happens to old people. And it only happens to the old people that I don't know and I don't care about. It doesn't happen to my family members. Right? And death is not going to happen to me. I am going to conquer death. Yeah. Because they will finally, the scientists will finally discover some way to keep this impermanent, constantly decaying body alive forever. Do you want to live forever in a constantly decaying body? Yeah, well, that's, you know, we're living in that. We have a precious human life. We want to preserve our precious human life as long as we can so that we can practice the Dharma. But when death comes, why freak out? Yeah, it's as soon as you're born, you know you're going to die. Yeah, so, and when you think about it in samsara, we've died countless times. Yeah, isn't that amazing? We have had beginningless lifetimes, so we have died countless times. Yeah, so done it before. Uh, Why freak out? Why freak out? Well, I feel guilty about some things I've done. Yeah, when you aren't at peace in your own mind, with your actions and your ethical conduct, then you freak out at the time of death. But if you're at peace with yourself, and even if you've made mistakes in your life, you've done purification practice, you've regretted those mistakes, you've made an amends, you have a determination not to do it again, yeah, you've done some virtuous actions, then, you know, you've learned from your mistakes. And then you can go on without feeling guilty, without being weighed down by, oh, look what I've done. Yeah. And they say that if we use our our precious human lives really well and create a lot of merit and really listen to teachings, meditate on the Dharma, then they say that dying is like going on a picnic. Yeah. That it's, it's fine. Like, you know, if you go on a picnic, you're happy. Yeah. So it's like going on a picnic. Mm-hmm. I was... Uh, 
I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going off theme here. But it's about death and going on a picnic. So I was living in Dharamsala at the time, and uh, Dharamsala, India. And uh, right below where I was living, there were some mud huts where some of the meditators lived. You know, older monks who were just, you know, really doing their practice. And one day one of them uh, fell down and he started hemorrhaging inside. So blood was coming out, you know, of his lower orifices. And uh, above where they were staying, there was a, a Western retreat center. So one of the Western women was a nurse. She came down to help him. So he's in, in his room, bleeding, okay, profusely. There was a, a plastic sheath under him. And not only blood, but it, it looked like part of his insides were coming out too. Uh, and my job was to take the path the plastic sheath with the blood and insides out and throw that over the, the uh, side of the mountain and then bring the plastic sheath again to put under him. Okay, so uh, he, he uh, wanted his body placed in certain positions having to do with the Buddha figure that he had been meditating on. So the nurse put his body in those positions. Now his other friends in the row of mud huts were out at the time that this happened. When they came back and they heard what happened to him, they immediately started doing pujas. Okay, so pujas aren't just singing and, you know, um, sound ringing bells and playing drums. There are actual meditations that you do. Yeah, so while you're chanting, you are visualizing and thinking about what you're saying. So they started doing the pujas and meditating very, very strongly for their friend and because it, it was clear that he was dying. After he passed away, one of the meditators went into the room and uh, checked because there's sometimes signs of if somebody had a good rebirth or a bad rebirth. And they say if the heat leaves the body from the lower part, the lower legs, that that doesn't bode well for their next life. But if the heat leaves the body from like the head, then that's a sign that the person's going to have a good life. So this one meditator went in, checked him out, and he came back. His friend just died, and he came back smiling. And he said, he's going to have a good rebirth. Yeah, the signs were there. It also has to do, you know, other things. But, and his friends continued to do the practice. Nobody was sobbing. Nobody was crying. Yeah. Nobody was going, ah, he died. I should have been able to prevent him from dying. Yeah, you should have been able to prevent somebody from dying, even though the Buddha can't do that. So his friends were relaxed because of their practice. The monk, as he was dying, was relaxed, like going on a picnic, because he had spent, you know, most of his life in Dharma practice like that. Yeah. So it was quite something for me to see people react like that. Meanwhile, the Westerners who were uh, you know, living in the building above his huts. Uh, when they heard that he was sick, 
They jumped in the Jeep. They drove all the way down the hill to the hospital, got a doctor, frantically drove up the hill to the doctor, rushed the doctor into the room of the monk who was dying, and the doctor looked at him and examined him and said, he's dying. <laughs> and the Westerners went, oh, isn't there something you can do? We should be able to prevent this. How can we let him die? Yeah? So it was so interesting for me to, to see, you know, if you've trained your mind in the Dharma well, you know, death is an accepted part of life. And you can meditate while you're dying. And your friends support you by meditating and doing puja while you're dying. If your mind is not steeped in the Dharma, then you're like the people going crazy, driving down the hill and driving up the hill with the doctor and, you know, crying and like this. Okay? So my whole point here is if we have a clean, clear motivation, yeah, to become Buddhas for the benefit of living beings, all living beings, then no matter what we go through, we're able to maintain our focus and having a positive mind. Yeah? And there's even a way in Dharma practice to transform adversity into the path. Yeah, because adversity is going to come to us. Uh, anybody here never had problems? Yeah, we've all had problems, right? Yeah, if we're skilled in the Dharma, we know how to look at those problems so that we transform them into the path to awakening. Okay, so that's uh, something I want to talk about when we get to our topic, even though I'm giving quite a long introduction. <laughs> and maybe I better tell you now because we won't get to our topic. <laughs> okay, I did this last night too. I just started out with an introduction and it ended after an hour and a half and we dedicated the merit. <laughs> Okay, so this is actually, you know, the, the topic of our thing, of our talk, is to uh, deal with unwholesome states. Okay, so let's give an, an example of when you're suffering. And, you know, when you're suffering, what's your mental state usually? Are you happy? No. Are you angry? Yes. Is anger a wholesome, virtuous mental state? No. no. Do you want to continue having it? No. Okay, so what do you do? Yeah, you're sick. You're angry. It's somebody else's fault. That person on the MRT who sneezed. Oh. I wish I could recognize him because he's why I got sick. And I want to go and sneeze on him <laughs> and get my revenge because how dare he do that to me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, not, not very virtuous, is it? Yeah. So how do you deal with the anger when you don't feel well? Yeah. Well, one way is to say, yeah, is to relate this to karma. Yeah. Why am I sick? Well, in the past, in a previous life probably, or maybe this life, 
uh, I harm somebody else's body. Yeah, maybe I got in a fight and I beat somebody up, or I slapped somebody, or I did something. I was a soldier and I, you know, killed somebody, or I assaulted somebody in the street, or who knows what I did, but I harmed somebody else's body intentionally. So that action that I did in my previous life left a karmic seed on my mind stream. And now that karmic seed is ripening because of the cooperative conditions, the guy sneezing at, you know, on me and me having a body that is prone to sickness. Yeah. And so I got sick. It's due to causes and conditions. Yeah. Nobody was out to harm me. Yeah. This is a result of my own negative actions. So if I'm the one who created the primary cause for my being sick by har harming somebody else's body in a previous life, then why am I angry? doesn't make any sense to be angry because I'm, you know, it's the karma that I myself created. There's nobody to be angry at. Okay? So if you think like that, then you just let go of the anger. You can accept, oh, I'm sick. Yeah? And then you remember, oh, yes, Sickness is part of being in samsara. Why am I in samsara? Yeah, how come I'm not out of samsara? The Buddha is out of samsara. How come I'm not? Well, you know, countless eons ago, maybe the Buddha, before he became a Buddha and was an ordinary being like me, Maybe he and I hung out at the mall together. Yeah, and we hung out at the mall, and then we sat down and we had dinner, and, you know, kind of went to Santosa and rode on the cable cars, and, you know, we did that. I was good friends with the mental con previous mental continuum of the Buddha in a previous life. So how come he's a Buddha now and I'm still here in a body that gets sick? Well, between then and now, the Buddha, that person who was the Buddha practiced the Dharma, realized the, uh, the nature of reality, used that realization to purify his mind generated the bodhicitta, that aspiration to become a Buddha to benefit all beings, purified his mind, created a lot of merit, and he became a Buddha. Why am I not a Buddha? I just kept going to the mall. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do anything with any of my lives between then and now. I went to the, to the mall, I went, you know, out to eat. I played video games. Yeah, I didn't do anything useful in any of those lifetimes. Yeah, maybe I drank some. I was an alcoholic one lifetime. Yeah, well, that's why I'm not a Buddha. And that's why I'm still prone to getting sick. So what am I mad at? Yeah, if I don't like the situation of getting sick, then I need to stop creating the cause for it and stop harming other living beings' bodies. Okay, what does that mean? It means that I don't go out and pick out live animals and have the cook drop them in boiling water so that I can have dinner. Oh, I have to give up eating 
seafood. It's my favorite seafood. Oh, I have to give up. Buddhism is so difficult, it's torturous. How will I become a Buddha with this kind of burden on me to give up seafood? Oh. Yeah, well, what's, what's more difficult? Yeah, eating somebody else's body for lunch and giving, you know, and not becoming a Buddha or giving up eating somebody else's body for lunch and using that time, you know, to create virtue and practice the Dharma. Yeah, what's more worthwhile? Yeah. Is it really that hard to give up eating meat and fish? Is it really that torturous? Yeah. I became a vegetarian before I even knew about Buddhism. But I became a vegetarian because I was traveling in Europe and we were in Germany and they, we went to the market and got some stuff called sausage and we cooked it and when you, we cut it open, all this blood came out. Yeah, and I found out later it was called blood sausage for a reason. <laughs> and, and it dawned on me, my goodness, when I eat meat, I'm eating somebody else's body. Yeah. And then I thought, would I give up my life for, for somebody else's lunch? What was the answer? No. I want to live. I don't want to give up my body for somebody else to have lunch. Well, neither did that cow. And neither does the sea fish. You know, the seafood. Now, let's not stop calling them seafood. There's fish, yeah, and then there's lobsters and crabs that, you know, we don't have to see them as fish. Uh, so I never asked that lamb, do you want to die so I can have lunch? I didn't even ask it. I just assumed I can go and eat somebody else's body. No problem. But when I really thought about it, I thought that's not fair. That's not fair. If I don't want to give up my body for somebody else to eat, why do I assume that they want to give up their life and their body for me to eat? So that kind of did it, yeah. When I went to see my parents afterwards and told them I don't eat meat and fish, my mother goes, what am I going to cook for you? <laughs> you know? as if there's nothing else to cook but meat and fish and chicken. And I said, Mom, there's lots of stuff to eat besides that. And you can eat a balanced diet. Yeah. And now, you know, not only do we save lives, but if you care about climate change, yeah, one of a, a huge ca uh, cause of releasing methane into the air, which is a huge pollutant, is uh, raising livestock. Yeah? Because the livestock eat and they poop, and the poop gives off methane. Yeah? So if we care about the environment and we want to live in a clean environment, and we want to be kind to the next generation who comes along and lives here, then we should stop creating the cause for more greenhouse gases. Yeah. Okay. So you see, but what, what the Buddha taught relates very much 
to our life and to current issues in society. Yeah, what the Buddha taught is not something old-fashioned, you know, and it's not something that has nothing to do with our lives. It has everything to do with our lives and how we live, what decisions we make. Yeah. Okay. So maybe now we should say refuge and body <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so when we do these verses, imagine in the space in front of you the Buddha with his body of golden light, and he's surrounded by all the other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and Arhats, all the holy beings. And they're looking at you with compassion and with complete acceptance. There's no judgment at all. And so you know when the Buddha is looking at you with compassion and acceptance that you're safe. Yeah? That the Buddha cares more about helping you become enlightened, then he cares about his own welfare. And then imagine not only the Buddha and the holy beings in the space in front of you, but also you're surrounded by all sentient beings all of whom want happiness and don't want suffering and are totally equal in that regard. And so when we take refuge and generate bodhicitta, we are leading all those sentient beings who don't know the path to happiness. We're leading them to take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha and we're leading them to generate kindness and love for all beings and compassion for all beings. I take refuge until I have awakened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the merit I create by listening to the Dharma, I will attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I have awakened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the merit I create, listening to the Dharma, I will attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I have awakened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the merit I create by listening to the Dharma, I will attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and its causes. May all sentient beings not be separated from sorrowless bliss. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free of bias, attachment, and anger. So have a little bit of silent meditation. Maybe think about what we just talked about.
and then let's think that we're going to listen and share the Dharma together this morning so that we learn different skills, we learn how to develop compassion, how to realize the nature of reality. And we want to do this not only so, so that we will attain nirvana, but so that we can become the most compassionate, most wise, and most skillful and powerful in leading other living beings to practice the Dharma and attain Buddhahood. And let's have that be our motivation for sharing the Dharma this morning. In uh, this book, Guided Buddhist Meditations, yeah, um, there's a section on page 150 uh, called Antidotes to the Mental Afflictions. Okay, so the Buddha in his teachings, uh, you know, as he described the world from the viewpoint of having a virtuous mind, he talked about how to deal with our afflictions. Okay, so afflictions mean any kind of mental state or mental factor that disturbs the mind. Okay, any kind of wrong view that if we follow it, will lead us on bad paths to make bad decisions, okay? So why are we unhappy? It's, the problem is the afflictions, the klesa, okay? So this is uh, our chief enemy, yeah? Our klesa all uh, come, they're, they're rooted in ignorance, yeah? and in our self-centered thought. So those are the two, uh, uh, those are the two commanders, okay? And then the afflictions are the army that go out and attack our mind, <laughs> okay? So the Buddha talked about how to subdue these um, because we have mental afflictions, you know, all day long. Yeah. Do you ever go one day without getting upset about something? I don't mean hysterically upset, but do you go one day without getting irritated or frustrated or angry? No, it's like there every day. Yeah. How about do you go one day without thinking without being greedy, without being attached to something. Yeah. It comes up in so many ways, you know, kind of there's a buffet lunch and it's like, well, I want to be early in the line, not just so I can eat first, but so that I can take more. If, if I come later in the line, then other people have eaten it and I just get a few little things. So when we're in the front, we know that other people want, have to eat, but we don't care. We're going to take as much as we want. Yeah, do you do that? No. 
But I'm always at the end of the line behind people who do. They do that, but I don't do that. Yeah. Okay. So, it, you know, how about jealousy? Do you, are there people, yeah, that you're jealous of kind of every day? Yeah? Somebody's better looking, somebody's more artistic. Somebody can run down the escalator and the MRT faster than you can. You know, you're jealous of something. Yeah. How about arrogant? Arrogance and pride. Do those occur almost every day? I'm kind of better than the people in my workplace. Yeah. I know I'm better, but these people don't realize, realize that I'm better and that if they didn't have me working here, the whole place would fall apart. Yeah. So they should be very glad that I'm working here and I'm on their team because I'm superior. Okay. I'll tell you a secret about what people who are arrogant. Actually, it's, it's only a secret to the arrogant people, everybody else, you know. Why does somebody get arrogant? Okay, here, we're gonna talk about arrogance first, the antidotes to arrogant. You know, why do you get arrogant? and stick your nose up in the air and think you're better than everybody else about something, you know. Why do we do that? Because we don't really believe in ourselves. If we believe in ourselves, if we feel comfortable in our own skin, we don't need to go around and tell people how good we are. Because other people thinking that we're wonderful, it's just their thoughts. It doesn't mean we're wonderful. Yeah, similarly, people thinking we're bad doesn't mean we're bad. Yeah, we have to look inside and see if we made mistakes or if we have a fault. Okay. So when we don't really have confidence in ourselves, yeah, then we fake it and project ourselves as being very wonderful. Yeah. When you look at movie stars, yeah, those people need other people's adulation. Yeah. It's like food for them. They can't go without a crowd saying, you're wonderful, and being written up in the newspapers and having so many pictures flashed of them. You know, that makes them feel good. It makes them feel like they're somebody. Why do they need to go to that extreme to feel good? because they don't really believe in themselves. Okay? So the same applies when we're being arrogant. Yeah, we're not accepting ourselves in some way. Yeah. So it's important, uh, you know, we're not perfect beings. Yeah, that's okay. But it's important to understand that we have the Buddha nature and we have the ability to become fully awakened beings. So if we're not the best athlete and the best artist and the best programmer and the best dentist or whatever you are, that's okay. You have the Buddha nature. Yeah. And you don't have to, you know, go around impressing others to feel good about yourself. Yeah. 
because there's a lot of self-acceptance there. Yeah. So I, I remember one, and this was around this time when uh, the Dalai Lama won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989. And he was uh, in Southern California on a panel with all sorts of other very famous people who were experts in their field. And <clears throat> somebody uh, raised their hand and asked to the whole panel, asked them a question. Or no, they asked it to the Dalai Lama. They asked His Holiness this question. I can't remember the question now. But His Holiness just paused and then he said, and this is in front of an audience of thousands of people, he was asked this question, and he paused and he said, I don't know. And the auditorium was silent. The expert said, I don't know. <gasps> How can an expert say, I don't know? That's so humiliating. Yeah, he must really feel awful because he doesn't know the answer and he had to say it in front of thousands of people. <sighs> yeah. And then the Dalai Lama was fine. He said, I don't know, no problem in his mind. Yeah. And then he turned to the other people on the panel and he said, what do you think? And again, the audience was like, wait a minute, the expert not only doesn't know the answer, but he asks other people because he thinks they might know more than him. <gasps> what expert? ever reveals that they don't know something and that somebody might, else might know more. <gasps> and again, you know, His Holiness could do this because he doesn't have any ego problems. He doesn't need to prove himself to the world. He doesn't need to declare how wonderful he is so that other people think he's good. He feels comfortable with himself. Okay? So, one of the antidotes to arrogance yeah, is to learn to evaluate ourselves and accept ourselves for what we are. You know, know that we have good qualities and then use those good qualities to benefit other living beings and help society. We know we have bad qualities, so let's work on improving. But we can do all of this without feeling bad about ourselves and without covering it up by putting on this fake image of how great I am. Yeah, makes sense? Another antidote for arrogance yeah, is, you know, because when we're arrogant, we think it's because somehow inside us, we are superior. Yeah, there's all these living beings, and I, 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 I am superior. Okay, and then you stop and think, okay, where did my talents come from? Yeah, when I was born, when I came out of the womb, out this big, did I have any of those talents? Did I have any of those good qualities? No. When I was born, 
Uh-huh. I cried. That's the first thing you do when you're born. And they whack you on the bottom, saying, welcome to the world. <laughs> but they do it for our own good. Yeah. So, you know, where did we get the qualities? How did we learn to talk? Okay, talking, understanding language is an incredible ability that we have. It gives us access to so much knowledge. Yeah. Where did our ability to speak come from? We weren't born with it. When we came out of the womb, our only vocabulary word was eh. How did we learn to speak? Other people taught us. How do we learn to read and write? Other people taught us. Who toilet trained us? My goodness, we should bow down to whoever toilet trained us. Yeah, because if we weren't toilet trained, boy, then we really had problems. Yeah, who toilet trained us? Other living beings. Yeah. Everything we know, every ability we have, every talent we have, every teeny bit of knowledge we have came from other living beings who taught us. So what is there for us to be conceited and arrogant about if everything we know came from other living beings. It's not ours. It's others. Yeah. And they were kind enough to teach us. But that's no reason for us to think that we're great. But then you say, oh, but there's some baseball player, I don't know, Singapore. You follow baseball players? No. Uh, no? Oh, okay. Because in the New York Times on the front page today, there was some baseball player. He was from Asia, and he just got a $700 million contract to play baseball. Yeah. That's not peanuts. <laughs> yeah. Either that or it's a whole lot of peanuts. <laughs> yeah. But who taught him to be such a good baseball player? To whack that ball or to catch that ball? Who taught him? He wasn't born like that. Yeah? Other living beings taught him, yeah? Probably starting when he was a little kid, throwing the ball back and forth with his dad or his older brother, yeah? And now he has coaches who teach him, yeah? And we got $700 million contract. <gasps> he must be just magnificent. Well, he's still open to aging, sickness, and death. Yeah. He still meets situations that he doesn't like. He still experiences the loss of what he wants and the frustration of not getting what he likes. Because somebody else got a seven hundred million and ten, no, seven, hun, seven hundred ten, and ten million dollar contract. Yeah. So he's jealous. Somebody's getting paid ten more million than he is. Oh, how dare somebody else give him a contract like that? Yeah. The guy's miserable. Also, when you're famous because of an ability like that, 
Is that ability going to increase as you age? No. You might be the best in the world right now, but you're going downhill. So if that, the amount of money you make is your uh, uh, standard for being happy, if the amount of publicity and fame you have is your standard for being happy, then what's going to happen as you get older and you lose those abilities? It's going to be trouble. Okay? So why get angry? I mean, I'm sorry, why get arrogant? There's no reason to get arrogant. So if you meditate like this, yeah, it should not bring low self-esteem. It should bring self-acceptance. It should dissolve your arrogance. And it should also make you see that running after worldly money and fame and status isn't really worth it in the long term because all those things disappear. But what is worth it in the long time term is the merit you create, the Dharma teachings that you listen to, and the imprints that are in your mind stream because of hearing those teachings and practicing them. That's what's worthwhile. That is what will be comforting to you when you reach the end of this life and look back at your life and you can say, I use this life well. Yeah? I practice loving kindness. I practice compassion. Yeah? I created merit. I purified my mind. I listened to Dharma teachings. I thought about them. I put them into practice in my daily life. That was a life well lived. Yeah. And then you can die. No regrets. No fear. Bye, everybody. (laughs) Yeah. One of my teachers said that when you have that kind of mind when you die, then your mind is really free. And he gave the analogy of a a boat in the middle of the wide ocean, no land around. That boat is there. And you're a little bird on on the uh, edge of the boat. Yeah. And when you're that bird, you just take off and fly. Yeah, You just take off and fly. You're not going, oh, I don't want to leave this boat. Yeah, my friends are still on it. I don't want to leave. Yeah, I have such a nice nest on this boat. I work so hard gathering the hay and the and the sticks to build it. Yeah, and now I have to leave my nest. No, that bird, that bird isn't looking back was they're flying ahead saying, I want to go back. They just fly. They just let go. Yeah, because they have that kind of uh, confidence and fearlessness that comes from a life well lived. A life that was lived with ethical conduct, with compassion, with kindness towards others. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So let's see what other afflictions we can apply antidotes to. Okay, there's many pages in this book, um, in this chapter. And you know who wrote the book? <laughs> Do you know who wrote the book? Yeah, you know, you, you, see, you see the name there? What's that name? <laughs> What's that name? Yeah, 
aren't I wonderful? Yeah, I wrote this book. The, the, yeah, thank you, more. Let's hear some applause. Yeah, me. Yeah. The problem with it is, it's whatever I wrote was somebody else's idea. I just copied somebody else's idea, and I'm going to get all the credit for it. Yeah, I copied the Buddha's idea. Yeah, and he's not suing me for infringement of his intellectual property. Hey, I got a good deal, huh? Yeah, I get royalties. They give me about five pennies per book. You do not get rich being an author. Yeah, unless you write something about Trump's White House. <laughs> then a lot of people want to read your book. Okay, my books. Mm -mm. Okay. So here, next one, attachment. Well, let's go directly to anger, okay? Anger. Okay, first thing, yeah, as a remedy to anger is to think about its disadvantages. Yeah, when we're angry, we don't see any disadvantages to our anger. We think, I'm angry, I'm right, they're wrong, the solution is they must change. Yeah, and there's no disadvantages for my anger because it's giving me the courage to stand up because somebody just called me a jerk. And that's the worst thing that can happen in this universe is that somebody doesn't like me and called me a jerk. And they called me a jerk in front of everybody else. So I'm angry. Yeah, I'm furious. And I'm going to put that person in their place. They are never going to call me a jerk again. Okay, what's the definition of a jerk? Yeah, has anybody? I've never looked it up. Yeah? Have you ever looked up the word jerk? What, what's a jerk? Yeah? We don't even know what, what somebody's calling us, but we're very offended by it because we know it it's means that we're not very good. But we don't really know what it means. But anyway, nobody's allowed to say that about me. Okay, so the first thing, you know, in working with any affliction is to see its disadvantage. Yeah. So what's the disadvantage of being angry? Yeah. Well, first of all, one moment of anger can destroy a lot of merit. So when we create merit, we work very hard at that. But when we get angry, it destroys the merit. It inhibits it from ripening. So anger is actually our enemy. It robs us of the merit which we created, which is the cause of happiness. Okay. Now, when you're merit, when you're angry, yeah, we'll put it this way. Do you like being around angry people? No. Yeah. And if somebody in your family is angry, yeah, what do people do? Probably some people may stand up and argue back. So then you have two angry people. Yeah. yeah. And some people probably go in their rooms and close the door to be away from it all. Yeah. So, no, you know, being around somebody who's angry is not very entertaining. It's not very agreeable. Yeah. 
it's like, yeah, who wants to see somebody who's yelling and screaming and having a fit? Yeah, but that's what we look like when we get angry. But somebody's going to say, no, I don't yell and scream when I'm angry. I just turn my back and walk away. Go in my room. Slam the door. <laughs> and sit there and pout. And wait for the person who made me angry to come to tiptoe in the room and say, Dear, are you angry? <laughs> no! <laughs> I apologize to you for what I said. Will you forgive me? Forget it! <laughs> yeah, we're so wonderful when we're angry, aren't we? Yeah, even somebody apologizes, we just dump on them some more. Yeah, that's not very nice, is it? Okay, more disadvantages of anger. It ruins friendships, generates tension with colleagues, and is the main cause for wars and conflicts. Yeah. Look at the wars being fought around this planet today. Yeah. What's feeding all those wars? What is feeding all those people killing others and people getting killed in wars? Yeah, anger. And behind the anger is attachment. They want something and they're mad they're not getting it. Mm -hmm. Now we might say, well, I'm not going to start a war. Well, okay, maybe we're not going to start international wars. But we might start a war in our own family. We might start a war at our workplace. Yeah. There's somebody we don't like at work, so what do we do? Yeah, we're angry at them. So we get all of our friends at work together and we together criticize that person. We trash that person. Yeah, they're so bad, they do this, they do that. We totally ruin their reputation. Then we feel, oh, I'm so good, I must be better than them. Huh? That doesn't make much sense. Okay. So when, when we're angry, also, yeah, when somebody is angry and uh, I hear them criticize somebody else, and badmouth somebody else, I don't trust that person afterwards because I know that if they badmouth somebody else to other people, they're going to do the same thing to me. Yeah, because that person gets angry and then talks behind other people's back. And it's only going to be a matter of time before they do it to me, too. So I don't trust them. So if we have a hot temper, that's how people look at us. They don't trust us. Yeah. And in a family, if you don't trust somebody, that's going to be real difficult, is it? How are you going to have a happy family? Yeah. So there's so many disadvantages to anger. So one of the antidotes to anger is not being so attached to things. 
Yeah. Another antidote to anger is seeing how your own anger harms you. Yeah. We think our anger will harm somebody else so that they will do what we want. No, our anger harms us. It makes us miserable now and it destroys our merit. And when we, you know, die and we want a good rebirth, where's the merit to support that? Okay. So that thinking like that, those are good antidotes to merit, to uh, not merit, to anger. Yeah. Okay, so the Buddha taught so many antidotes, you know. For attachment, one of the chief antidotes is to contemplate the impermanence of what you're attached to. Okay, because what you're attached to looks great now, yeah, but it's in the process of decaying and getting old. Yeah, so why cling and grasp at it now, thinking that it's the source of your happiness when it's only going to deteriorate and you'll have to throw it out at some point? Yeah. So that's a, actually a very good antidote. There was one uh, Dharma practitioner, I think it was Ayat Kema. And she was talking about impermanence. And she said, when I look at my precious cup, I think my cup is already broken. Yeah? Because it has the nature to break in it. It hasn't broken yet, but it's going to break. So it's as, as if it were already broken, so why am I clinging on? This is my cup, my beautiful cup. It's nicer than anybody else's cup. And my great aunt gave it to me, so it has so much sentimental value. Yeah. No, it's already broken. Yeah. I, I remember when one of my friends was uh, doing a, a garage sale. I don't know, in Singapore, do you do garage sales? Yeah, you don't, you don't have much, yeah. So in the States, when somebody is moving or when they have extra objects, they'll put them out, you know, in the front of their house and they'll put a, uh, a message in the newspaper. There's a garage sale and you know, then people come and they buy things that are somebody else's things that they don't need anymore. So my friend was having a garage sale and he had put out for somebody else to buy um, things that, decorations in his house, wall paintings or nice things that you put on your table in the living room. And he had put out things that had so much sentimental value to him. It was so hard to think of, of selling these things because, you know, somebody really dear to him had given him this object. And so he put very high prices on those things because from his viewpoint, you know, this, uh, uh, this plate, yeah, this plate, that he got in Mexico and on this wonderful trip he had with his family. And it's so colorful, this beautiful plate with so much sentimental value. And he put it out for other people to buy and he put a high price on it because to him it was a really expensive, you know, plate, a worth, something worthwhile. And nobody wanted to buy it for that price. And he was like, why? Why don't they want to buy it for that price? And then he realized it's only be he charged that much because it had sentimental value to him. 
But to the rest of the world, there was no sentimental value to this plate. It was just a plate with colors on it. Yeah? So, you know, this is what attachment does. We impute value on something that actually doesn't have so much value. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we didn't get through all of them. This book, by you know who authored it, <laughs> there's only two volumes left, this one and one on the left no, no, over no. there. Oh, so this is the only one. So now we're going to auction it off <laughs> because we're fundraising to build the Buddha Hall. Yeah? So the highest bidder can get this. We'll put it out on the table. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's dedicate the merit now. But let's uh, rejoice at the merit we created. Okay? And really rejoice. You can't see merit with your eyes, but you can feel merit in your heart. Yeah? When you keep your five precepts well, when you practice generosity, when you practice, uh, you know, learning the Dharma and, and living it in your daily life. Yeah. You can feel the merit underneath buoying, buoying you. Am I saying that right? Buoying you up. Yeah. You can feel, this, this is, you can't see any of it, but it's the, a feeling of being supported by your merit. And nobody else can see that and nobody else can take that away from you either. Yeah. But that's what you want to take on with, with you to your next life. So when you create merit, really rejoice. You know, you did something good. So give yourself some credit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then we'll uh, dedicate that merit for the awakening of all living beings. We're not dedicating it so that I can be rich and famous, yeah, so that I can be wealthy in my next life, so that I can have spiritual realizations. We're dedicating it for the well-being of all living beings and their awakening and our awakening. Due to this merit, may we soon attain the awakened state of Guru Buddha, that we may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their sufferings. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Good. Thank you, venerable children. Can we please give three prostrations in thankfulness and gratitude and appreciation? <laughs>